Everybody, let's give Jesus a hand praise real quick. God, you are awesome. Turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 1, verse 8. One verse of scripture, I'm going to let you be seated. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. This is Jesus speaking, and he says, but you will receive power. Everybody say power. When the Holy Spirit has come upon you, in other words, you don't receive the power until the Holy Spirit comes upon you, but when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you will receive power, and then something amazing is going to happen. You will be my witnesses. Everybody say his witnesses. witnesses. Not my church's witnesses. Not my religion's witnesses. Not my denomination's witnesses. Not my theology's witnesses. Not my politics' witnesses. Uh, I got quiet on that one. Y'all, y'all want to witness for your politics. And you will be Jesus' witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea, and Samaria, and to the furthest parts of the earth. Father, thank you for your presence. It's already been so powerful in this house. I ask that you would anoint our hearts and our minds to hear and receive, but then allow that word to come into us, take root in us, and change us as we leave this place. In Jesus' name, everybody said amen. You can be seated. Keep your Bibles open. We're going to be in Acts chapter 1 and Acts chapter 2 all day today. I made mention earlier in the worship that today is the 2022nd anniversary of the church or the birthday of the church. Today is Pentecost Sunday. Come on, let's give some noise for Pentecost Sunday. And I want to clear things up for all the people that are not Pentecostal. This is not the day that we take as a license to be weird. That's not what Pentecost Sunday is all about. Pentecost Sunday literally means 50th. Everybody say 50th. And the 50th that we're acknowledging is 50 days after Passover. So 50 days after Jesus was buried, 50 days later, something amazing happened. And that's what we are going to be talking about. In fact, we're diving right into this to learn about all in. And we do this at the end of each quarter. We, we go into the last month of each quarter, starting off with all in Sunday. All in Sunday is all about showing you how you can personally get engaged in what God is doing, not only in your church, but also get engaged in what God wants to do in your life and also through your life. And as my wife has already said, we got food today. Praise the Lord. I'm so thankful for jambalaya and Cajuns that know how to cook good jambalaya. When you go out there, make sure to give David a big old hug and say, hey, and he'll appreciate it. There we go. So this is all in Sunday, but I, I felt like this would be a really great day for us to lean into what Jesus began doing in the house or doing in the community of, that he was going to establish 2,022 years ago. And this is the, the scripture we just read in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Is, is laying the foundation for something that he had been talking about for several months before his arrest, crucifixion, death, burial, and his resurrection. And this is just before he ascends back into the heavenlies and he meets with them on a mountaintop and he says, I'm gonna tell you some things and if, if you wanna find some connection, Mark chapter 16, it's the same conversation. Matthew chapter 28, the same conversation. And we can see different viewpoints on what was said in this moment. But this is not a separate conversation. It's all the same conversation before Jesus ascends. And he says, I want you to know something. I've been with you and you've experienced a lot with me. I've walked alongside you. I've taught you a lot of things, but I'm no longer just going to be with you. I'm going to be in you. And this is where he's beginning to shift the, the focus of this whole relationship with God thing, shift the focus of their time in discipleship because he's getting ready to send them out into the world to be effective. And I want you to notice some things about this text, but let me just lay some foundation before we get directly into this. Jesus started with them where he planted them. He, he says, you're going to receive power. If you don't mind, put the scripture back on the screen. You're going to see, receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses first in Jerusalem. Everybody say Jerusalem. Okay, y'all are too quiet today for Pentecost Sunday. Everybody say Jerusalem. Jerusalem. Come on, say it like you're Pentecost. Say Jerusalem. Jerusalem. There you go. You're all Pentecostal now. We'll bring out the snakes later. I'm kidding. We won't bring out the snakes. That's weird. That's gross. Don't touch snakes. Ew, gross. Bye. Jesus begins his work in your life where he planted you. 
God doesn't just randomly start working in you and through you. He doesn't just say, okay, now you're a part of the body of Christ. Go and have fun. No, that's not what it is. God begins to do work very, very intentionally. And if you'll notice this, this breakdown, he says, I want you to start in Jerusalem. Then I want you to go to Judea and Samaria. And then I want you to go to the ends of the earth. I, I'm going to begin doing some things to you, but I don't want you to immediately go to the other side of the world when I start working in your life. There's work that I'm gonna begin in the house where I'm planning you, and then it's gonna to begin to expand from there. And notice that he says, I'm gonna start a work in your life, but I'm gonna start it right here. So does it matter where I worship? Yes, it does. Does it matter where I'm connected? Yes, it does. Because God is moving people. God is transitioning people. God is, is bringing people into the house. He's connecting people in the community that are vitally important to what he wants to do in this day and in this age and in this season. And he's saying, I want to pull you in here because there's something that I have for you in this house, but I'm going to begin my work in you in the place that I planted you. And once you get planted, once you get rooted in the place that he's planted you, this is when he can begin to entrust you with legacy. From time to time in the life of a church, you got to make adjustments in the language. And as long as I can remember, this September will be 10 years that NOLA Church has been going on. And as long as I can remember, we've used the language, we're going to leave a legacy, right? We're going to leave a legacy. I'm changing the language as of today. So all, all of you administrative people that like to take notes, we're changing the language today. Y'all ready? We're no longer leaving a legacy. He's entrusting legacy to us. The question is, what are we going to do with the legacy that he's already given us? The problem is we're trying to leave our legacy. And he says, no, I gave you legacy. Are you a good steward of that? Amen. And if you've missed any of the last couple of months, we gave you a lot of really, really good tools and a lot of really good biblical foundation. You can go to nolachurch.com on our YouTube channel and you can get caught up. Before I get any further in, I just want to say buena asafiwe to all of our family in Kenya. Come on, y'all. Let's give our Kenyan family a hand. <laughs> Praise God. All nine locations of NOLA Church in the nation of Kenya and also our family in Australia and the other parts of the world. We're thankful that you were joining us and all the people who couldn't make it out today because of various things. We're glad that you're joining us. Hope you are enjoying the sermon. Y'all ready to go deep? Yeah. Cool. Turn, leave your Bibles right where they are, Acts chapter 1. We're going to go back up to verse 4 and 5. If you need a title for today, I'm simply titling it Pentecost MMXXII. 2022. I figured I don't watch the Super Bowl, so this will be my Super Bowl. Is that cool? Nothing wrong with you if you watch the Super Bowl. I just don't. I think it's boring, and, but this is my Super Bowl. There we go. I will watch the Food Network, though. <laughs> Bible says keep your priorities right. Anyway, <laughs> it doesn't say that. <laughs> All right, Acts chapter 1, verse 4. My Lord, it's going to be a bad day today. The jokes are already getting stupid. Here we go. Miss Pam, I missed you last week. My jokes were really bad and they're worse. Anyway, Acts chapter 1, verse 4 says, While he was with them, who is he, Jesus, he declared, Do not leave Jerusalem. Everybody say, Don't leave Jerusalem. But wait there for what my father promised. Somebody hear me. Don't leave. They that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They that don't get out ahead of what God's got for them just because it got uncomfortable. Don't leave. Somebody hear me. You've been contemplating. Don't leave. You ain't got to go nowhere. God's got you. He brought you to this Jerusalem on purpose. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait there for what my father promised. What's he talking about? You got to go all the way back to John chapter 16. You got to go to all the way back to John chapter 20, right around verse 21. He's talking about the promise. And he says, which you heard from me. For John, meaning John the Baptist, baptized with water. What is the baptism that John brought? It was a baptism into repentance. It was a baptism literally acknowledging that we need something more than just a surface level experience with God. I want you to understand that I'm transitioning you from a life outside of relationship with God into a daily active, intimate, personal relationship with the living almighty, the one who was and is and is to come. 
I'm transitioning you there. It begins with a mind change that results in action change. For far too many people, repentance has become a religious ceremony where we confess and then we go out and do it again because we're just going to confess again later. That's not repentance. That's religion. Repentance starts in the mind. I am a sinner and I need a savior. And what I'm doing is distancing me from my savior. It's time to make a change for once in my life. It's going to feel real good. It's going to make a difference. I'm going to make it right. Aye, 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 aye. Ow! <laughs> anyway. Sherman, you're getting ready to move. I, I got to give you all the stupid jokes before you move. <laughs> If you didn't get that, you should listen to better music, I'm just saying. But John baptized into repentance. John the Baptist was the forerunner of Jesus, meaning he came before to prepare the way. Before you can get the power that God has for you, you have to begin in a position of mind change and intentional action change. Well, when I repent, God's going to take it away from me. No, he's not. He's going to trust you to man up or lady up to believe her up and make some changes in your life. Amen. John baptized with water, but you will be, everybody say will be. You will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. In other words, it has not happened yet, but it's going to happen. God is making a very distinct difference in our understanding that there is something different between repentance where we walk into that relationship with Jesus and that place where Jesus literally begins to indwell us. Religion will tell you that repentance is all you need, but I'm telling you, you can't live the life that Jesus promised in Acts 1 verse 8 until you you are filled to overflowing with the breath of the almighty God. It begins with repentance. It continues in water baptism. But there's so much more than just say there is a God. He wants to baptize you and literally fill you with everything that, that he is to empower your life to be different. Well, that's not for me. Yes, it is for you. It's for everyone. We'll see that here in a second. But he is, he's talking about, look, guys, I'm getting ready to leave, but I want you to remember things that I've already taught you. By the way, believer, if you're not spending time in the really thick left part of the book, you're missing a lot. It's really easy in today's non-denominational culture to spend a lot of time in the Pauline epistles, which are great. By the way, it's thick, it's burly, but every one of those are built right here. Anyone tells you you don't need the Old Testament, you need to immediately turn them off and walk away. That beeping noise you hear in the back is God turning on the reverse, saying, get away from that. You need to get up in some Old Testament so you've got some foundation, amen? Nina, you going to preach with me? She's like, yeah, I'm going to preach with you. <laughs> you got to get in the Old Testament. Because that's where the foundation is. You, you got to have something in there so that you understand that you need to repent of your sins. You need to change your mind and then change your actions. But he's not going to stop there. There's so much more. Let me just say this. You have to learn to wait on Jesus. Don't get ahead of his plan. Wait. I don't like it. I don't agree with it. Welcome to earth. If you agree with the gospel, you are the first among many humans who have ever been created who actually agrees with the gospel. The gospel is offensive. It is supposed to offend you. It is supposed to tick you off. It's supposed to mess with you. It's supposed to like hold you in a headlock and mess up your hair and give you one of those red things on top of your head. That's what the gospel is supposed to do. When did it become this deal like it's, it's going to make me feel good? No. Because if you felt good, there would be no need for a savior. If you were born holy, if you were born perfect, you would have no need of a cross. Then why did the God of all gods robe himself in flesh and sacrifice himself to redeem you? No, you need some change in your life. You need some repentance in your life. And then once that happens, you need some power in your life. Amen. But we like to get out ahead of God because we want it here and we want it now because we live in a microwave society and we want to put the button 30 seconds and I've got everything I need. Like, no, it's a trial. And then, then cultural Christianity goes out there and writes books and podcasts and, and movies and TV shows trying to convince us that everything is just wonderful. You choose Jesus and there will never be any more drama in your life. Really? 
These are believers that apparently don't go to church. <laughs> right? Like you're going you're gonna to walk through hell the moment that you name the name of Christ. It doesn't mean God has abandoned you. It doesn't mean that you're living in sin. It's because you are a believer and you're walking into the realm of the devil taking ground back. You're going to get some opposition. And it's going to get uncomfortable. There's going to be moments that it's challenging. There's going to be moments where you think everything is going good and, and life is going to pull the rug out from under you. This is when you find out if your faith is based on Jesus or based on your emotions and your feelings. Because how do you respond, not react, how do you respond in the middle of the trial? you got to learn to wait on Jesus and don't get ahead of his plan because he wants to empower your life. He doesn't just want you to enter into relationship with him. He wants to literally empower this relationship so you don't have to rely on yourself as your source. If we are our own source, our source will run dry. There is a fountain of living water that shall never run dry. And if we're not drinking from the fountain, nothing is going to change in our life. Jesus is telling them something very vital. The Bible tells us in, in Acts chapter 1 that he has spent 40 days after his resurrection hanging out with them, popping in and out of conversations, like freaking them out. Let's just be real. They're having a small group. Hiding from the law, breaking the law, breaking the law. <laughs> Every now and then you got to throw a bone to the law at rockers. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, all right, we'll stop. There we go. <laughs> They're hiding. Because they're, they're scared of what's going to happen. They're just hanging out, just, just talking and like, man, I wish Jesus was still here. And he's like, peace be unto you. And they're like, oh, crap. <laughs> like I, may, maybe you would be okay with some dude that you thought was dead just suddenly shows up in the room. Tug, don't play that. No, I, I don't. I, no, I, I, me and ghosts, that ain't happening. People come to New Orleans like, we want to go on one of those French Quarter ghost tours. What the heck is wrong with you? I don't know if they're real. I don't want to find out. I won't even go in the Haunted Mansion at Disney. I mean, that's it. I'm a scaredy cat. My kids make fun of me. Dad, it's fake. I don't care. He has not given me a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a sound mind. I'm not going in there. Where are them teacups at? That's where I'm going. I ain't trying to play with no scared stuff. Jesus just popping in. Hey, guys, what's up? Oh, God. Yes. <laughs> and I love it. Peace be unto you. Like, that's the worst thing you can say to someone they're scared. It's going to be okay. Are you sure? This happens for like 40 days. Like, everybody's about to have a heart attack, like all the disciples. Oh, God. And for 40 days, this is happening. And it comes to the end and it's time for them to transition. Here's the deal. God is doing something in you, but he's not going to stop there. There's something more that comes. And, and you like those moments where you're walking and talking with him every day. But then there's going to come a time where he's going to send you out from the community. He's going to send you out into the dark, dark, hurting world. Because the church doesn't need the gospel because the church has the gospel. The church needs to take the gospel. Amen. I could preach on that a minute, but let me stick to the notes. Is that okay? And he tells them, I want you to go to Jerusalem, and I want you to wait. It's really, really interesting. The same place that they went to wait is the last place that they had dinner with Jesus. When Jesus, you've heard of the Last Supper, you've heard, that's the last time Jesus experienced Passover celebration with his disciples. This, this place had been reserved for him, and that's exactly where the disciples went. They went right back to the place that they had experienced Passover with, they had experienced rest with their God. They knew if I go back to the place of rest, I'm going to make a connection. Somebody hear me on that. Passover isn't about communion. Passover isn't about ceremony. It's about walking into the rest and the promises of God. They went right back to the last place they experienced it. And he says, I want you to wait in Jerusalem. I know you've got plans. I know you've got desires. I know you've got dreams. I know you've got feelings. But I want you to wait 
where I have already begun to do the ministry in your life. And they go there and they hang out. Here's what's interesting. In Acts chapter 1 verse 8, there's roughly five to 600 people on the side of this mountain when Jesus is talking. But literally 10 days later, there's only 120 left. Not everyone that begins the journey with you is going to make the journey. You don't need to get all caught up and, and crying about it. Love you. Needed your chair. Enjoy it. I love you. But don't get caught up in what was. The problem with humanity is we get so caught up in the past Remember a few months ago when we were talking about when God came and he talked to Joshua and he made that really bold statement. He said, hey, Josh, Moses is dead. In other words, stop living in yesterday. I've got a whole brand new tomorrow for you, but you got to let go of what was. Don't live in yesterday's experience because there's something more that I have for you. 120 are left in this room. It's men and women. Even Mary, the mother of Jesus, was there, and they're, they're just hanging out. And they're, every day they're spending time together. They're, they're reading the Old Testament scriptures, and they're, they're singing songs that more than likely they wrote in the moment. And, and they're just talking about things, like rehearsing things that Jesus had taught them over the last three and a half years of their life. And Mary is telling stories of the last 33 and a half years of his life. And they're just enjoying community together in this place of unity and they are praying and the Bible says they are sitting in this spot where God has already ministered to them in the place that he told them to wait. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all in one accord in one place. What does that mean? 50 days after Passover, they are at the end of the Feast of Pentecost, the Feast of Weeks. This is a feast that God put, or a celebration God put in place all the way back in the Old Testament. And they came to the very last day. They had been patiently obedient. Ooh. They didn't want to go back to Jerusalem. Somebody hear me. It's dangerous in Jerusalem. They go back to Jerusalem, naming the name of Christ. They're breaking the law, just walking back into the city. But the place that he's ordained you to wait is not always comfortable. You're going to get some challenges. But they trusted that the one who spoke is the God of all gods. They relied on him for protection instead of what they could bring to the table. And then they obeyed him. They may not have understood it. They may not have even necessarily liked it, but they obeyed him because, my friend, obedience is better than sacrifice. They go right back to the place that he told them to go, and they said, wherever you tell us to do, we're just going to lock in here in a position of unity. When the day of Pentecost, the last day of the this, this celebration, had fully come, they were all in one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind and filled all the house where they were sitting. The Bible says that tongues began to appear to them. And I know this isn't on the screen, but I'm in Acts chapter 2. There's 2, 3, 4, something, somewhere in there. Suddenly, a sound like a violent wind blowing came from heaven. What, what is this? The word that we hear here is the word pneuma. A violent exhalation of breath or a violent wind. Hurricane Ida. Hurricane Katrina. Any hurricanes that are coming here? Hurricane Waka Haka. I don't know what they're going to call it. We're going to get some more, but... A sound, not, it wasn't a violent windstorm. It was a sound like a violent windstorm. Words matter. Words matter. It sounded like a mighty windstorm. And it filled, and it, where did it come from? It came from heaven, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. It filled their unity. It did not fill their drama. It did not fill their chaos. It filled their place of unity where they were obedient to what God had already told them. When they were obedient and they got unified in community, God said, I can breathe in that. Filled all the house where they were sitting. Verse 3, and tongues. Y'all remember a few weeks back when we broke down what the New Testament word for tongues was? It's the word glossa. Okay, hear me. And glossa spreading out like a fire. Everybody say like a fire. Like a fire. It wasn't fire. 
Stop looking for flames to appear on your head. That's not biblical. That will set your hair on fire. We're not filming Pepsi commercials. That's a bad thing. And tongues spread out like fire. But notice that. Not this. Glosa. What is glosa? Glosa literally means an inspired word. The word of God by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit settled on each one of them. It appeared to them and came to rest on each one of them. What does that mean? As it rested like, Todd, can I use you as an example? I'm, I'm, in, I'm in unity with, with Todd and God's doing things and we're in unity, we're enjoying the presence of God, we're being obedient to God and all of a sudden the word of God settles on him and it begins to affect him physically and he can't see it but I can see it. And when it gets on him, I'm like, that is so flippin' cool. All of a sudden it sits on me, he goes, I can see it. It's like, dude, 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 sweet, dude. And it's like, it's, we can see it on each other. Here's the deal. When God begins to rest his reality and his word in your life, it's going to be evidence to everyone around you. And when it spreads on to them, it's going to be evidence to you. It wasn't fire. It was the word. It was the, the, the glossa inspired word of God resting on them and it was evidenced in them. Is your experience with God physically evident or is it personal and private and hidden behind all the layers of your carnality? Okay, let's move right on from there. <laughs> Verse four, and all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and they began to speak in other languages. Now, now the scripture breaks us down in two different words, but literally in the original language, it says glossa again. And they all began to speak other glossa. How? As the spirit enabled them. Okay, wh what is the difference between the glossa that settled on them and the glossa that they began to speak? The glossa that settled on them did not come from them. It came from the realm of God. It was not a language that they could understand. It was a heavenly language. But when it rested on them, their physical speech changed and they began to speak things they did not even know how to speak to people who could understand it. If your speech does not change when you encounter a living God, you did not encounter a living God. He will rest his language on you, plant it deep within you, and when he does, your speech will change. But here's what's cool. Your speech will now be empowered. How do I know? Because they, they immediately were overwhelmed with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And they, they did not stay in the upper room. They left the upper room. A real encounter with God challenges you to leave the place of comfort. I just need to, I just need to sit here. No, you don't. That's the problem. You sat too long. It was a season of rest and you thought it was a lifestyle. He didn't want you to stay hidden. You're a city set on a hill that cannot be hid. I'm going to send you out into the world, but I've got to get you unified so I can empower you. And empowerment does not come into a house filled with chaos. It only comes in a house filled with unity. But when the unity of the Holy Spirit comes in, that's when the baptism of the Holy Spirit comes. And there's going to be a word from God that rests on us. And we will begin to change the way we speak. And we will be speaking in heavenly language. And then when we step out of here, we'll speak in an earthly language we don't even know how to say. And it will begin to empower pack people's lives and radical things are going to begin to happen. And these, they spilled out and we got, y'all remember the noise God made? God made like this huge noise and people from all over the city. Who were these people? The Bible says that they were devout people that were living in Jerusalem at that time. Why were they there? For the Feast of Pentecost. These were not rabble rousers. These were not party. These were not people coming into town for Mardi Gras. They were not coming in to celebrate debauchery. These were people that were coming in to celebrate Passover. And for 50 days, they had been in an atmosphere of worship. And they heard a sound. They're like, I have never heard that before. Let me go do some inspection to see what's going on. And they show up and they see the 120 spilling out of this room, speaking in other tongues. Not jibber jabber. They're speaking earthly languages 
They had no business speaking. The problem with the church is we've, if we allow tongues to happen, we, only, we want it to only be heavenly. But we don't want to let the Holy Spirit empower our speech within the world in which we live. Why do we only want it to be heavenly? Because that's the gift of tongues and that's where we get edified. Go back a couple of weeks ago in the series and you'll hear exactly what I'm talking about. It's time for you to stop self-edifying. It's time for you to take that gift and go use it to minister to somebody else. Speak words that they can understand, but allow the Holy Spirit to inspire you and put it in your mouth because they need the gospel, amen? Come on, let's take about 20 seconds to give Jesus some praise. All right, that's enough. They're like, what are these guys doing? We hear them speaking our language and they're declaring the good things of God. Go back to the 1 Corinthians chapter 12. They're prophesying. They're declaring the good things of God. They're, they're speaking words about God by the inspiration of God to people who need God, who people who are desiring God, and things are beginning to change. And, and Peter gets real bold. He's like, hey, hey. Hold up, because they had just said, these are a bunch of fools, and they're drunk. He's like, no, they're not drunk. It's 9 o'clock in the morning. We're not in New Orleans. <laughs> Too soon? Okay, I'm sorry. We're not drunk. But this is exactly what you have been believing for all these centuries, this is exactly what the prophet Joel spoke about centuries ago that in the last days, saith God, I will pour out of my spirit on all flesh and my sons and my daughters will prophesy, not just the men, also the women. If you missed last week, ladies, you need to go back and listen to last week. Guys, if you think you're better than women, go listen to last week. You need some Jesus. All you religious folks, go listen to last week. I was biblical, you're not. There you go. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams and your young men will see visions. And I'm going to do some amazing things in the last days. And then he goes on just like me and he preaches forever. And they're like, okay. <laughs> Acts chapter 2, verse 37 and 39. Now when they heard this, what did they hear? They heard Peter's really, 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 really long sermon. Now when they heard this, they were acutely distressed. I love the way this translation was. They were acutely distressed. That means they were jacked up. <laughs> they were acutely distressed and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, what should we do, brothers? This is the question that we should be asking on the regular because this is the question that the world around us is asking every day of the church. How do I engage in that? When you speak truth, inspired by the one who is truth and you're not spouting psychobabble and you're not spouting your religious bull crap and you're not spouting the thing that you read off of the jacked up individual on TikTok. You're actually speaking truth that comes by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit through the lens of the word of God and you're speaking truth into someone whose life is filled with absolute untruth. There will be something in them that says, how do I connect with that? Verse 38 tells us the answer. Peter said to them, repent. In other words, change your mind, change your actions, and each one of you be baptized into the name of Jesus Christ. Why into the name? Because without the name, there is no authority. When you add the name of Jesus Christ, everything in your past is brought up under the authority because he said just 10 days earlier, all power in heaven and earth has been given unto me. You got to go to the source of authority, be baptized into the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins. In the original language, it says for the absolute eradication of your sin. Here's the question. When you got baptized, was it a ceremony and do you still struggle with sin or were your sins eradicated? Because real baptism eradicates the power and the root of sin in your life because it breaks the chains of the slavery of sin off of your life. You now have direct access to the one who has authority and you don't have to be a slave to that thing anymore. This is why believers have no business struggling with addiction. You've got power. Throw it away, walk away from it, break it off, block it on the phone, unfollow it on the social media, stop watching it, stop doing it. Pastor, can you pray that I'll get victory? Are you going to stop? Because if you're not going to stop, I'm not going to waste my time. It's a waste of my time. I gotta, I, there's food that needs to be eaten. 
Y'all with me? Be baptized in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins. And then what's going to happen, Pete? I'm so glad you asked. You will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. What is the gift of the Holy Spirit? What the 120 had just received just a few minutes before when they were in a place of unity in the position of obedience where Jesus told them to go and wait and unity happened. And he said, now I will descend my spirit and I will abide in them and I will empower their lives to actually do everything that I designed them to do. That is the gift of the Holy Spirit. Say, can you break that down? Absolutely. The gift of the Holy Spirit is the divine empowerment you need to be his witnesses. Here's the problem with religion. It's tried to convince people that all they needed to do was shake somebody's hand, sign a card, raise their hand at the end of a very emotional sermon, and that was it. They never changed their mind, they never changed their actions, and their life is completely empty. That sounds like a, a religion of works. No. It's, that is faith that has works because faith without works is dead. When you have faith in the Almighty, when you believe, when you trust, you rely and you obey, things will begin to change in your life. If things are not changing in your life, my friend, you do not believe. You simply acknowledge. And he's saying there's something more than mere acknowledgement. It's time to go a little bit deeper, amen? You say, well, how, how does this happen? I want you to notice some things. There were several people that were in the, in the upper room. But, but this early church, this church of 100, this church plant in mid-city Jerusalem had a core team already of 11 apostles. The 12th had not waited and tried to take things into his own hands and he was no longer with them. But they didn't stop because he wasn't any longer with them. They just kept doing and obeying because they didn't, they weren't in it for other people. They were in it for Jesus. It's okay. And the 11 were there. These 11 became the foundation pillars of what we know today as the church. The early framework of what God wanted to do in the world started in these 11 individuals. Remember the last two weeks we talked about divine order and then divine structure. In the place where God established order, power can be entrusted. This is why spiritual authority is so vitally important. If you have no authority, you cannot live an empowered life. And you don't receive authority doing your own thing. You only receive authority by getting up under authority. This is what Jesus said. Hey, I recognize that you have authority because you're under authority. And then he says, I haven't seen faith like this in all of the people who name the name of Christ. You got to get up under authority. That's why we spent three or four weeks just diving into that. I wasn't dealing with a problem. I was laying the foundation for today and where we're going tomorrow. You need spiritual authority in your life. So get up under spiritual authority so God can begin to entrust you with the empowerment. And somebody would say, well, that's not for me. That was just for the early church. So glad you said that. That's why Pete had to say, verse 39, for the promises for you and your children and to all who are far away, even as many as the Lord our God will call to himself. And here's the thing you got to hear me on. Every human being is called. Not just people in ministry. Not just people who make a living working for the church. Not just your favorite celebrity preacher. Not just the people who write the books that you buy at Lifeway. Not just the people whose music you listen to. Every person who names the name of Christ is called. And every person who doesn't even acknowledge him is also being called. Many are called, but few are chosen. The call is for everyone. So the promise is for everyone in every location, every nationality, every time period, every subset of society, every political view, every relational isolation, every addict, every person who's dealing with anything, the God of all gods is saying, 
Come here to me. I want to be in relationship with you. And when I touch you in a way you've never been touched, I want to empower you to live like you've never lived before. So here's, here's what we do. I'm, 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 I'm almost done. Here's what we do. Just like the people who heard what God was doing, and they said, what do we have to do? In other words, what's my next step or how do I engage? This is a question you should be asking Right here, right now. Here's what I want to do. In closing, I want to go to Acts chapter 2. Start with verse 42 and read down to verse 45. Notice this. They were devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching. Okay, what happened? I feel like we're missing something from the story. Peter gets through preaching, and they go on about life. And that same day, about 3,000 people were added to the church that day. Then they began to live their life. What we're reading starting in verse 42 all the way down to verse 47 is what happened after the empowerment of God took place. This is how we engage. What should we do? I'm about to show you. Y'all ready? Look at your neighbor and say, he's about to show us. Okay. I'm about to show you. Y'all don't even know that music? Golly, all my jokes are just falling flat today. They were devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching. What does this mean? They were literally dedicating, hear me, they were dedicating their lives to what the spiritual authority who had been placed in their lives was teaching them instead of looking for something that appealed to them. They trusted that God was in the midst because God was in the midst. And they were sitting in obedience and in unity. And so they recognized the voice of God coming through their leaders. Here's the deal. If you don't recognize the voice of God coming through your leaders, one of two things is happening. Either the leader is not following God or you're not sitting in unity. So you don't recognize that the leader is following God. But they dedicated themselves not to what felt good in the moment, not to what the person around the corner was saying, not, not what the church on the other side of the world was speaking. No, they dedicated themselves to what the apostles in their life were speaking to them. And they said, okay, this is where we're going. What is happening here? They were discovering. Everybody say discovery. And they also dedicated themselves to fellowship, doing life together. Everybody say community. And to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everybody say prayer. prayer. And then watch what happened. They dedicated themselves to discovery, community, and prayer. And reverential awe came over everyone, not just in the community, but everybody outside of the community as well. And many wonders and miraculous signs came about by the apostles. Everybody say creative. Some of you are starting to get where I'm going. All who believe were together unity, and they held everything in common. I want to be a book of Acts church. Do you really? Because they began selling their property and possessions and distributing the proceeds to everyone as anyone had need. Everybody say legacy. Okay. What we see here is the function of divine order. A few weeks ago, we learned the structure of divine order. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastor, teachers. That's the structure. When those are in place, the spiritual gifts can be facilitated within the community. We learn how to serve each other until we come to such unity in the faith that we begin to spread outside of the church and we begin to minister to other people's needs. That makes sense? We can't start out there. We have to start in here. Don't go serve on Saturday. I love what happened yesterday, but don't go serve on Saturday if you refuse to serve on Sunday because you learn how to actually overflow on Sunday so that what you give them on Saturday is not just a box of food or a piece of clothing or, or some medicine or some water. You're actually sharing the gospel. But there has to be a function of divine order. The structure of NOLA Church is built on Acts 42 to 45. Because there are five key elements that we see here in these four verses not in any particular order, but we see discovery, community, prayer, creative, and legacy. These are the five foundational circles that our church is built on. We use the word circles just because 
I like the way circles look. They're pretty. I have OCD and they make sense. That's the only reason. There's nothing spiritual in the whole circle thing. Stop acting like it's metaphysical. It's not. I just like circles. This is our structure. This is what we're founded on. Ministry in this church happens in five areas because we want reverential awe to be in here. When you get out of your car and you start walking into this building, I want you to feel the presence of God even when you're out on Salmon or when you're out on Edwards. When you log on to the online worship experience, I don't want you to just be logging. I want you to feel the power of God. The tech may not look good, but I want you to feel the power of God. And here's the deal. I'm sick and tired of there not being signs and miraculous wonders. So y'all, let's get unified so we can be empowered, so God can start revealing himself even in our worship experiences. Creative is where we first start. This is what you can do. What should I do with this? Get involved in being creative and then get involved in prayer. Learn how to grow spiritually. Don't just go through the motions. We turned our building and our whole facility into a 24-7 prayer room two and a half years ago, and God is doing radical things. You can come up here any time of the day and night and pray, and the presence of God is here. And radical things are beginning to happen because we are becoming a church with a culture of prayer, and I think we're only scratching the surface. It's time for us to go even further and even deeper in this. And then as we begin to grow spiritually in prayer, we need to learn to grow as believers. This is why we need, we need to discover who he is and who he designed us to be. We need to discover our calling because he's pulling us into relationship. We need to look what that looks like. Learn the value of being a member of the church instead of just dipping in and out whenever it feels good learning to take responsibility within the community so we can live in unity. But then don't just stop there. Learn to be a leader, not only within the church, but also outside of the church, at your job, at your school, wherever you do life. Learn to be a leader because you're a believer. You've already been entrusted with leadership. You need to get the tools on the inside of you so that you can be the person God designed you to be. That's what discovery is all about. But you need to do life with other believers. Far too many of us are too busy to do life with other people because we're uncomfortable in the proximity of someone who's going to challenge us. And that's why there's no fruit being produced in our life. You need community so that you can grow. You're not going to grow sitting down with me to talk about your problems. After the first meeting, you're not going to want to meet with me anymore because I'm going to start off. Okay, first off, do you tithe? Because if you don't tithe, you won't trust anything else I'm saying because you don't even trust God. Let's, let's go do something. Let's go enjoy a burger instead of talking about this because everything I'm going to say is going to come from right here. And if you don't trust this, tithing isn't about money. It's about trust. That's where I'm going to go. And like people, I don't want to meet with him anymore. You're welcome. And by the way, when you, when you pull away from me because you don't want me to talk real, don't go talk to any of the other pastoral team because I've instructed them to tell you the same thing. You don't need us to pat you on the head. You need us to challenge you to lean in, to be who you're supposed to be. You need community in the, in the body. You need to be surrounded by other believers to hold you accountable to the character of Christ, not accountable to some church standards, accountable to the character of Christ. Why? Because God wants you to be a witness. The whole reason he baptizes you with his spirit is so that you will be a witness. What is that all about? That's him entrusting legacy to you so that you can steward the legacy in the body and outside of the body as well. Why do we serve? We don't serve for the photo op. We don't. In fact, I, I really wish we had stopped taking pictures, so many pictures of what we do. But the reason that we do it was we want to challenge other people to get involved. That's the whole reason we do it. I wish there was a way that we could just serve and not take pictures, but then some of y'all wouldn't know what was going on because you don't listen to the announcements. But anyway, whole other story. But I really wish we could get to the place that we no longer even needed to take a picture of it. But we learn how to serve here. Because you have needs, and you have needs, and I have needs, and he has, and she has, and we all got needs. All God's children got needs, right? 
if I can't serve you, how can I serve someone I don't even know? It's not overflow at that point. It's religious activity and it means nothing. Humanitarianism is pointless if there's no power. I can give you a bottle of water when you're thirsty, but if I'm not, if I'm not connecting you to the fountain of living water, I've actually hurt you. Got to give you what you actually need. We've been entrusted with divine legacy. What is the divine legacy? The baptism of the Holy Spirit, the identity of who God is, and that all the authority in heaven and earth has been given to him, which means he's entrusting it to us. We are the ambassadors of the Holy Spirit. We have responsibility. We have legacy in us. Go live legacy. That's how we engage. Y'all, I'm going to challenge you. Function within the parameters of the structure he put in place, not a structure that feels good to you. And then trust his divine order and submit to spiritual authority. A couple weeks ago, we did a pastoral panel and Joe led it and he said something so profound and I'm hanging on to this. This is stuck with me for two weeks, Joe. Spiritual authority is not overbearing. It's not control. It's empowerment. When you and I submit to spiritual authority, what we're doing is we're coming up under a covering and we're standing on a foundation. No one's telling us what to do. They're empowering us to do. Let the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and the pastor teachers come around you and the rod and staff of God, which are not weapons of punishment, but they are weapons against the enemy to keep you in place. Let them fall down. When you go to step in, that enemy's pulling you in. The, the rod and the staff of God goes out. Doesn't strike you, strikes the enemy. But you got to stay in the position of spiritual authority. And this is when God can do something powerful. Notice what happens in 47. They continue daily praising God and having the goodwill of all the people. And the Lord... All you people that are obsessed with church growth and getting more people in your small group and getting more people on your team, listen, and the Lord was adding to their number every day those who were being saved. God's promise is expansion. But he can't trust you with expansion until he can first trust you with unity. But when you get unified in his spirit, with your brothers and your sisters, he says, okay, I can empower that congregation and I can do something radical in that congregation and I can stretch them and they can leave the comfort of church and they can step into the world and speak what I empower them to say. That sound good to anybody? I hope, I hope this has been a challenge for you. I hope it made sense. If it didn't, while we're eating jambalaya, ask me any question you want to. I will make up an answer, I promise you. It's a joke. I won't really make it up. I hope right now you're asking the question, okay, what do I need to do right now? In fact, here's what I'd like for us to do. Every eye closed, every head bowed, nobody looking around, nobody moving. I'm going to dismiss you here in just a second. If there's anybody in this house this morning who's like, I need to know how to engage, I just want you to slip your hand up real quick. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Leave your hand up so I can see you. Thank you. That's awesome. That's awesome. I'm proud of it. All right, you can put your hands down. Okay, I want you to hear me. Nobody's looking. This is a moment, just you and God. God wants you to engage in everything that he is and then engage in the place that he's planted you. It begins with a personal interaction and encounter with the Almighty. I don't even know how to go there. No problem. In your own way. In fact, if you want to lift your hands, that's fine. You don't even have to do that, but just begin to tell him how much you love him. Just begin to tell him how much he means to you. Tell him how much you need him. 
Say, I don't, I don't even really know the words. Say, no problem. Right where you are, you can just say it like this. Say, you're worthy of it all. This is that moment of worship. You're worthy of it all. Far from you are all things. That's changing your mind. And to you are all things. That's changing your actions. You deserve the glory. Y'all help me sing right now. This is a song of repentance. You don't know what to pray, sing this.